Hi, welcome to Virtually Together. I'm Janelle Riley. I have a great guest today. Uh, Stephen Chbosky has a new book. Well, it came out in October, but it's still new and you should read it, called Imaginary Friend. This is the first book he's published in 20 years since Perks of Being a Wallflower uh, became a massive hit. Uh, he's one of the only people who has adapted his own book into a movie, um, and he's batting a thousand with his movies. Uh, he wrote and directed Perks of Being a Wallflower. He directed Wonder, which was a fantastic adaptation. Anyway, uh, we'll talk some more, but I just want to get right to it because he's uh, a great guest and just a wonderful person. So without further ado, here's Stephen Chbosky. Stephen Chbosky, thank you so much for being here with us today. It took you 20 years, but you published another book. Um, I actually have two copies. Hey, that's how that. good it is. I've been giving them out as gifts and, and I'm thank always you. excited. Yeah, imaginary friends. So the obvious question, why 20 years? Well, uh, as I, 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 I know that you know, because you've interviewed me for all of my movies and such, I've been busy with uh, many other things um, going back, oh gosh, 12, 13 years now, uh, when I did the show, TV show Jericho, and then from Jericho, I did The Perks of Being a Wallflower, and from Perks, I wrote Beauty and the Beast, um, the live action remake, and then I, I directed Wonder, and now I'm, I'm involved in Dear Evan Hansen, so it's just been a very, very busy time, um, and uh been a very busy time and you know, plus the most important thing is I got married and had two kids so it's it's been quite a quite a time but I always knew I wanted to get back to uh, writing novels so writing the Perks of Being Wallflower novels was one of the greatest joys I've ever had artistically um, if not the greatest and so I wanted to get back there and do it again. I certainly didn't mean to imply you haven't been busy because I know you've been busy, but um, I'm so glad there is ne another book. Um, well, you know, also you say something interesting when you said like, why 20 years? I think in a lot of ways, and, and this is for any writer that's listening in on me right now, I had it in my head. I remember when I was 12, I said to my dad, um, dad, I want to be a writer. And what I meant to say was novelist. Um, but I said, writer, he said, well, great writers are great readers. And then he kind of like left the room to smoke a cigarette and, and watch the hockey game. And it was good advice, but I didn't, I'm 12, and I didn't take it like advice. I took it like a rule. I was like, huh, well, he knows I'm not a good reader because I'm pro I've never been diagnosed. I'm probably dyslexic, at least some form of it. I'm a very slow reader. So I said, well, he knows I'm not a good reader, so I can never be a great reader. So well, I guess I can't be a great writer. Well, wait, you know, I read movies, I guess. I watch movies all the time. All right, I'll write movies. I mean, that's why I chose movies. And if he hadn't given me that advice, I don't know if I ever would have found this whole career in, in cinema. Um, you know, wow. so I applied all of my desire to be a novelist into my movie career and television. And so, and so when you ask why 20 years, it's because when I published the first movie, Wallflower, I considered it for many, many, many years as just kind of a fluke. Um, it's like, well, I just, cause I went to film school. I didn't go, I never learned proper, um, I didn't even know the word epistolary when I published it. Literally, I'm not, I'm not, this isn't a cute thing to say. I didn't know what a, what a an epistolary novel was. I just knew that that was what Perks should have been. So I did that. And then when I was actually doing the movie adaptation of The First Being Wallflower, that woke me up to the love of, of writing novels all over again. Um, because I went back into it, reading it as a grown, as a grown up now, basically. Um, and saying, wow, this is really good novel. And why I should do this again? This is this is something very lovely. Let me see if I can do it again. I wanted to challenge myself, so here we are. But you had the idea of uh, imaginary friend brewing for some time, hadn't you? Yes, yeah. but you know, I, I think I was just going to make it a, a make it a movie or something. It was a mm -hmm. I love I love the premise and I love the idea of a little boy that's that's speaking to this imaginary friend and the idea of you know whether that kid is you know as some people think. It, you know, very disturbed or is this really happening and how when you're young so often, you know, if, if you've been through some things like you don't know the difference. And I thought that that would be a very powerful theme to explore. And I ended up writing a lot about childhood. It was actually, it ended up becoming a fiercely personal book to me. Um, even though it, it's, it's, it has elements of the supernatural and elements of horror. It's, it's, it's very emotional for me. Yeah, I want to let people know. I, I love it says on the on the cover, author of uh, Perks of Being a Wallflower. Um, this book does share some DNA with Perks of Being a Wallflower in that it's it's such a character piece. It, it captures um, youth so well, but it's scary. 
<laughs> it's really well, I, uh, <laughs> thank you. That's a huge compliment. Well, you know, it's funny. Back back when I was twelve, and I said to my dad, "I want to be a writer." Um, he said, "Great." The only person I read was Stephen King. I think maybe because of the dyslexia or whatever it is that 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 it's for whatever reason his rhythms and the way he wrote, I could follow it, and it was so readable. And and I so he's. I mean, to this day, he's my favorite author of all time by far. Um, but like going back, he was the only one I could read. And so in a lot of ways, Imaginary Friend is my tribute to, to the master and as like a personal thanks. I actually put him in the acknowledgements. He's the final line of the acknowledgements. You're kidding. Do, do you no. know if he's read it? I, I know he's a very busy guy, but. Yeah, um, no, I don't, I don't believe that he has. Um, I did send him a copy, um, but I do know that his son, Joe Hill, read it and gave me a lovely blurb. The fact that I wrote a book that scared a king so badly that it woke them up with a nightmare, you know, on their on their uh, trip to, to Italy. I'm, I'll take that. That's like the greatest compliment I can have. The fact that I scared a, a man, a, you know, and Joe Hill's such a great writer. The fireman is so great. He has so many great ones. You know, Nosferatu, you know, the list goes on. So um, he's a big, he's a, I'm a big fan. He's great. And so uh, getting his blurb meant the world. But like, hopefully someday his dad will read it. That is amazing. Um, and I want to let you showed me earlier, but I want to let everyone see we're in your office. You've got some of your uh, movies in the background well, yeah. there. There it is. Our well, yeah. Well, I, I usually I usually write right here. I'm, I'm on a table and I write here because like on the corner of my eye, I always like to see what I've done. And um, and uh, it, it inspires me to keep going because I just want to fill every square inch of wall I have. Well, you technically could. There, I see like the, there's there's space where you could put some other things. I don't see uh, four oh, for sure, yeah. Oh yeah, well, for sure. But like, I have this blank wall. There's a lot of walls. You you only you're only seeing a little piece of it, you know. Um, but yeah, this this is just a much better background for for you know anyone that's watching because you got the nice steps and you know always you know once a director always a director. I can't just give you a blank white wall. I want to give you some texture and it's like you know hope, hopefully. Uh, Hopefully, um, Logan and Emma and Ezra aren't too distracting back there. Your head is actually blocking Ezra, but I know oh. he's there. I can see Ezra. There he is. Hey. Hello, Ezra. Such a, you know, I have actually, was actually tr racking my brain trying to think, do you know of any other authors who have adapted their own novels? I mean, other than Stephen King, I guess. Um, yeah, Stephen I, I, King did. He did Maximum Overdrive from his short story, Trucks. Um, I understand that Norman Mailer did it once. I don't, I don't know what that movie was. Uh, Ethan Hawke did, um, what was it called? Uh, it was called the, the Oh, Hot State. State? Yeah. yeah, yeah, his debut. He did that movie. Um, Michael Crichton did The Great Train Robbery. That was probably, of all of them, the most successful of all the adaptations because that was a, a fun book and a, and, a, and, a, and a really fun movie. Um, and, yeah, and then The Perks Being Wallflower. I, I, I actually think, because I'll, I'll adapt Imaginary Friend, I might be, I think I might be the first person in, movie history to do it twice. I don't think anyone's done it twice. Wow. Was it's there kind anyone? Of rem remarkable. You think a hundred, you know, cause, cause Woody Allen, I mean, he, I mean, Woody Allen could do it in his sleep if he wanted to, but um, he never did it this way, you know, to write the book and then adapt it. It's, it's a, it's a, it takes a remarkable amount of OCD. <laughs> this may sound um, strange, but did anyone ever try to talk you out of it? Or like, did someone else want to adapt Perks of Being a Wallflower at some oh, point? Many, many people, yeah. I turned down an offer from MTV years, like 20 years ago to do a, make it as a series. Um, Fox wanted to buy it. But again, at the time, I'd been around Hollywood enough to know that it would never survive a, a typical development process. So I just, I just would never sell it. And I waited until I was ready until, because I knew that I was either going to direct the movie or the movie wasn't going to exist. I didn't, I wasn't interested in, in selling it. I didn't want to, you know, and, and it took some courage early days. Cause I'll tell you, they, I was offered, I think at one point, like $175,000 for it um, early in the two thousands. And that was all, I mean, I, I had like, you know, I think I had like 17 grand to my name. You know what I mean? So, I mean, that it was, it was a lot of money. And, but I just knew in my gut, I'm like, I don't know, you just, you can't sell this one. It's too personal. It means too much to me. And it, and I know that even if I w went in with great faith, you know, cause the people that wanted it obviously are people who were fans. They were lovely people mm -hmm. like across the board. 
all of them were, were like, hey, um, the drug use or, oh, geez, um, what about the, the, all that twist at the end? Ooh, you know, and I just knew to get the, the um, authentic story through, I had to figure out a way to kind of circumvent the system. And ultimately, I got lucky and I did. Well, and sort of along those lines, talking about imaginary friend being so many years in the making, um, are you glad it took that time? Because I have to imagine by the time things happen for a reason at the right time, sure. and by the time you're ready, to direct perks of being a wallflower. I mean, the, the movie couldn't be any better. Um, I remember after an early screening, I, we joke about this frequently about how like I was telling you how much you liked it, and you're like, "Oh, I'm so relieved," and I'm like, "No, no, no." I'm relieved because I didn't know what I was going to say to you if I didn't like it. And thank God I didn't have to worry about that. Well, oh, I'm glad. I'm really glad. Yeah, it's tough. It's tough when, you know, you know, I heard this great story once. Oh, no, it, would, it would take 50 years. It, it, anyway, thank you. I really appreciate, I appreciate what, what you're saying. And, and yeah, it's been really gratifying. You know, it just got released on Netflix a couple wow. of weeks ago. And it's, it's, it's really remarkable to see suddenly I'm getting emails and texts you know, a whole new wave of people that, that you know, there's a, a, it's a remarkable truth that people's viewing habits, if you're a television watcher, you watch television, you're Netflix, you're net, like people have this thing and it's in the fact that it's been able to bounce around all these different platforms and I have all these waves. It's, and plus my book started, started selling like hotcakes again. It was really remarkable. Really? Yeah. That's so cool. I mean, it has stood the test of time. Do you, even though it's, you know, you, you wrote it 20 years ago, um, or it was published 21 years ago, I should say. Um, why do you think it still resonates so much today? Um, well, I, I think, I, I wouldn't venture to guess. I, I would say, though, that, that there's a certain, there's a certain, like, group of people, right? And the, there are new ones every year. Um, where at a certain time of adolescence when you're feeling alone or, or you're struggling with the beginnings of, of, let's say, a depression or a mental illness or there's been some trauma or some abuse or it's it just, it's, it's a story that, that covers a lot of basis, you know? And um, over the years, I have received so many letters um, from people that it helped them through, you know, I was in the hospital and helped my stay or, I was feeling suicidal and, and I decided, I read your book and I, I decided not to, to kill myself. And I received so many letters at this time, I can actually kind of speak of that, like not nonchalantly, I would never do that. But it's just, I don't know, it just seems to have this very deep resonance in people. And the remarkable thing for me, is the fact that I wrote it for such personal reasons. I was in a dark place and Charlie was my answer to help me get out of it. Wow. And what's it like when you're doing an adaptation versus adapt? Well, I guess you are, you're adapting your own work, but when you're adapting somebody else's work like Wonder or even Beauty and the Beast, um, but you still make it personal, I have to imagine. You have to have a personal connection in order well, you to- you have to. Yeah, I, what I found is, was I find adapting other people's work far easier than adapting my own because you have their brain, you have their resource, you have other drafts to pull from. So, you know, when I did Beauty and the Beast, for example, um, I had, you know, Linda Wolverton's brilliant movie, and I had Evan Spiliotopoulos. He did some really great things in his draft of the screenplay. So when I came on board um, to work on the character stuff and some guest on stuff in the second act, et cetera, I had all these really great things to, to pull from. And whenever I was stuck, I would literally do that. I was like, God, I don't know what to do next. And I would just watch, the, I would watch Linda Wolverton's animated film again and, and just say, oh, that's why she did that. Okay, I, I'll do it this way. And, and so it's, you know, and same with Wonder. With Wonder, I was the fourth screenwriter on it. I mean, Jack Thorne's amazing. Stephen Conrad's great. Um, and then, and then there, was a, there was a team, they didn't get credit. I, I, I wish we could have even done a special thanks, who came up with, um, it was John Kirkidis and uh, his uh, partner. Um, they came up with a thing on uh, where the, I'm um, sorry, where the boys were making up through Minecraft, which I thought was a beautiful, beautiful sequence. I loved making that, and that was their idea. And so I was fourth, and then I had R.J. Palacio. So I had like all these brilliant minds throwing in, and I was able to just fuse. I had my own ideas and things that I added, of course, but I was able to fuse all of these brilliant people together. 
and that's much more fun. When it's just you, it's, you know, it's just you. I don't know if this is something that uh, even applies to you, but do you ever struggle with writer's block? Yeah, I, I do. Uh, but, but, but it's not, I don't struggle with writer's block per se. I struggle with, I struggle with uh, motivation. It's different. I actually believe that writer's block doesn't exist. I believe that people get writer's block when they edit too quickly. It's like, look, I can tell you, this is how writer's block, how it doesn't exist. If you sit anybody down and you, you, you set a timer for 10 minutes to say, write, they'll write. It may not be good. They may not like it or whatever, but they will write. It does. So what we're really doing is we're just, we're trying to edit before we do it. You know, and, and my advice to anybody is, look, just write today and then judge tomorrow. If you can train yourself in that or, and or train yourself in just, if you go, you know, an hour or two and, and just create, create a system where the process is what makes you, the process is what makes you, uh, that's the thing to celebrate. If you put in three hours, hey, you put in three hours and that's great. But I think for me, um, sometimes I, I can't take my own advice. And it's not that I'm blocked. I'm just, I'm tired or, or there's other things going on. I have to say I have, I have struggled because of all the responsibilities with the kids and just, you know, you know, when you do three loads of dishes and five loads of laundry and, you know, you clean the garage out and you, you, so you turn around and you're like, oh, my five-year-old just destroyed that room again. Uh, you know, it's hard to, you know, get it up to like, all right, now I'm going to, let's do this. You know, so that's hard. Um, but otherwise, no, I wouldn't call it writer's block though. I would just call it kind of a lack of motivation. Something I, I really uh, am asking a lot of people during this very strange time that we're in, um, what are you sort of doing to keep saying, are there other books, other shows you're watching? I know you have two kids, so you're very busy with that, but is there uh, anything that's helping you escape at all? Yeah, there are a few things I would say. Um, you know, my wife, she loved Tiger King. Um, you know, I, I didn't jump on that. I, I, I got it, but I didn't, it wasn't my thing really. Um, um, but I, but so now, so she loved it and, and I was just like, okay, I'll go along with you. Now I have my thing, which is the last dance about the Chicago Bulls. Yes. It is so good. Oh my God. I love, well, I love everything about that series. I mean, we're six episodes in, you and I talking, I can't wait till Sunday to get two more. And, and it's so remarkable how, he, how humanizing that documentary is because Michael Jordan, you so know, good. Yeah, it's amazing. Uh, Michael Jordan is such a, he, I mean, he was a god in the 90s, a god. And now he's a human being and like to see him just like lay it all bare, yep. it's, it's just, it's very powerful. I, I love, so I love that talk. That's my selfish time. Do you um, even have to be into basketball to enjoy that? Because I'm not. No, I think no, I, no, I don't think so at all. Listen, you know, greatness is greatness. He's the best basketball player who ever played. Um, I think mean, I mean, maybe some would argue, you know, Kobe or, or, or LeBron James or somebody, but like for my money, he's the best. And to watch anyone that's great at anything, you know, it's like, I don't follow the, I don't follow gymnastics, but I'll turn on the Olympics and there it is. And it's, it's just fascinating to watch people who are great at what they do. Um, so I love the last dance and my kid, there's a lot of family viewing and it's been remarkable, like top chef junior, there's a lot of juniors. Uh, American Ninja Warrior Junior, my my five year old son, he can't get enough of that show. Um, so we've been watching that, and we were watching. There's a show on Discovery called Naked and Afraid. Um, have you seen it? I am very familiar with it. I came to it through parodies of it actually, That's and really then funny. saw the real thing, and I was like, this is even crazier than the parodies. Yeah, the the uh, <laughs> I think that you know when when this all started in the idea of survival. It just was very, very, it was very soothing to me to watch like people survive 21 days, like with no water, no food, no clothes, no everything. And you, you kind of get to the, the prime. And so that was very fun. And otherwise, you know, it's like, it's been a lot of news. Although I do have something, you know, I, I love, you know, Anderson Cooper show and Chris Cuomo, I, I, CNN is probably my go-to, but I have recently switched to simply because, because I don't have the time. I switched to just the, the CBS Nightly News with Nora O'Donnell, where it's just like, here it is, and here's like half an hour. Here's kind of everything that happened. No commentary, no spin, no 10 experts. And I found myself like getting much calmer. You know what really? I mean? Really? Because it's not, 
you know, whether it's MSNBC for the left or Fox for the right or CNN kind of a little bit more toward the middle, um, the, the, the nature of the, that programming is to get your blood up. I mean, that's what it, it that's, it's good television. It does that. And so I finally said, you know, I will reserve some time for Anderson Cooper, Chris Cuomo, or I'll watch, um, you know, I love John Oliver. He's so great. Or Bill oh Marlowe. my God, isn't he brilliant? He's brilliant. John Oliver's show is amazing. It's, uh, it's kind of never been better. It's kind of remarkable. So I will watch a lot of that stuff, Samantha B. But, but now I'm like, I'm more and more just, just give me the facts. Oh, is that what they're talking about today? Okay. Um, and, and just let me make my own decisions. I, I, I honestly wish that the country would all at once decide, let's just watch the good old fashioned six, six o'clock, six thirty news together. And we can all calm down and, and not get quite as upset and angry. Um, I think it might help a lot of people's blood pressure. I mean, that's the way it used to be. Gather around the TV while you're eating dinner, watch the 6 p.m. news. Yeah, and just yeah. And, then, and then, you know, yeah, well, not with my five-year-old. He, he doesn't know what, he doesn't know. He's just like, wow, I, oh, I guess we're home again. Okay. <laughs> American Ninja Warrior Jr. Now I'm going to, oh, and Top Chef Jr. And now I'm going to make my own thing. You turn around and you're like, He's taken three bananas, uh, oh a, an entire thing of salt, um, some Nutella, and, he, and it's, it, we can't stop it. And so we, we don't want to stifle the – anyway, it's, it's madness. So I, I, just do, I just do extra, uh, uh, extra um, you know, uh, donations to uh, Feeding America to, like, make up for, like, my, my, my son's – my five-year-old son's horrible food waste. I mean, it's, it's un, it is remarkable. I, God, I love Theo. Like yeah. It's he, fun. he makes food like I make food. <laughs> there you go. My, my line about Theo is he messes up the house, but he makes it at home. Oh. Yes. Are you going to use that in a book somewhere? Because that's really good. Uh, I probably, it was actually a song lyric. I, I wrote a song about my family once, and that was, that was where it came from originally. But yeah, I'll use it in something, for sure. Okay, I won't steal it then. Um, uh, before we go, I want to talk some more about Imaginary Friend because you have this great story. Um, and I rarely do this where I tell someone, tell that story. But um, Emma Watson kind of helped you with the ending, was it? Yeah, well, what happened was we were, we were on the set of um, Perks and we were filming The Secret Santa. It was that day. So, so we were filming The Secret Santa party and then we broke for lunch, which, you know, like, you know, in movies, lunch is like at 10 p.m. <laughs> so uh, so we, we broke for lunch and we sat there and it was just me and her on that set, you know, on the Secret Santa set and we're eating. And I said, oh, I, she's like, what are you going to do next? I said, well, I'm writing this novel. And uh, she's like, tell me about it. And I, I did the whole story. I start, And then the boy sees the cloud and follows the cloud into the woods. And, this ha and, and I was so into it. And I could feel, you know, she's a big reader and she's a wonderful audience. So she's leaning forward and forward and forward. I can feel her loving everything I'm saying. And then I go, get to the ending. And then this happens. And she went, huh. <laughs> and so to go from edge of your seat triumph um, to, huh. I go, what, no good? She's like, huh. And she's too polite to say that it's, it's rubbish, but, but and so I knew from her reaction that I was wrong. I didn't know what my fix was, but I knew I was wrong. And as it turns out, she was dead on right. My, my new ending is so much better. It, and it led to so many interesting things. And because you've read the book, you know, there never would have been, you know, that, that, that kind of like that reveal at, at the, the kitchen window. There never would have, there, all those things that went into it, it was, it was um, I don't know, it really unlocked the ending and so i will be forever grateful uh god bless people who are honest with their criticism or honest with their responses yeah they really do make us better <laughs> they do you know and as long as again it's, i i love what stephen king says in on writing which is if somebody says i loved it another person says i hate it he, i love that he says that tie goes to the writer kind of like a baseball tie goes to the runner so but it's like but there are those those certain few people that you know they're going to tell you the truth and you trust their taste. And, and again, her reaction was so unbelievably catastrophically negative for her. I mean, you know, she, she's polite to the last. Yeah. It was so bad. I was like, eh, I'm, I'm wrong. Okay. Let me, let me think about this some more. And, and I'm, I'm forever grateful. And, and, uh, 
you know, it was really cool. She did a, she did a special favor. Um, it was really nice. She offered it. It was lovely. I didn't even ask. I mean, she just offered where she said, let's do an event together. And we went to book soup and we recorded it and she put it on her Instagram um, thing, which was really sweet and interviewed me for an hour. It was really, it was a remarkable experience. She's a great person. That is so cool. Um, before we go, uh, can you tell us what you're working on? Anything that you, if you can't reveal anything, that's fine. But I'm so curious if writers are being even more prolific during lockdown. I don't want to put pressure on anyone. If they, if they do not have children, I'm sure they, they absolutely are more prolific. Um, uh, that is not my case. Um, uh, so what I'm writing, uh, what I'm working on is, um, the main thing was I was, uh, I think seven weeks, six weeks out, seven weeks out from moving to Atlanta, Georgia to direct Dear Evan Hansen mm -hmm. when this all happened. And so now, like, I know that, uh, you know, we, it, it, Universal still seems very, very passionate about making the film, you know, I mean, we're all so excited. Um, we've got Ben Platt, you yeah. know, uh, play Evan uh, for the movie. And we have, we have some other good cast that's starting to come together that I can't talk about, but it's really, really exciting. And so, I know we're going to make it. I just don't know where and I just don't know when, you know, because as I'm sure all of the people you talk to, you know, we're all just trying to figure out, okay, how do you, how do you make this safely? I mean, yes, of course for the crew, but for the cast, I mean, they can't walk around with masks all the time. They can't, you know, they have to, um, you know, I mean, a kissing scene is still a kissing scene. So how do you do that safely? And we're all, there have been many discussions, some really wild ideas and some great ideas, you know, um, and so we'll, we'll see. So yeah, Dear Evan Hansen would be my main focus. I also, there's a lovely thing I'm attached to over at Sony and I've been doing a draft. Um, producer uh, Larry Mark, uh, it's this lovely thing called Twist of Fate and Anj Gianetti, um, I'm working with her on that and she's just fantastic. So there's that. And then, um, you know, and there are other little things here or there, um, you know, one with Mandeville and really, you know, uh, depending upon how long this all goes, I was working on the, uh, the imaginary friend adaptation, yeah. um, and and I think I think when all is said and done, if this thing goes for months and months and months, that's going to be next up in terms of my keyboard. Really? Oh, that's great. Yeah. Well, um, I can't wait for you to get back behind the camera. Um, although I'm also enjoying what you're doing behind the keyboard. So thank you. Um, I, I have a I thousand recommendations it. for everyone to check out all your work. Thank you so much for joining us. Always, um, you know, Janelle, you are you are a treasure to me, as you know. I, I only wish we could have done this uh, like we usually do at the Smokehouse. That would have been way better. <laughs> I miss the Smokehouse very much. I went to the Smokehouse the other day just to get the garlic bread. Oh my God, it's so oh, good. Oh, they do in takeout? They, they are. Done. And you know now what? That I, think you know you, that. I think you just gave me uh, dinner tonight. Yeah. Thank you. Although the last time we had a meal, uh, we did not go to the Smokehouse, but we did get to see Antonio Banderas. Oh, yeah, yeah. We, we went, you know, <laughs> yes, absolutely. Yes, uh, where do we, it was that, oh yeah, was the, yeah, there you go, yeah, which, was, yeah. which was amazing, but no, I always think about the Smokehouse, that one lunch when Wonder came out, and uh, I don't know, it's just like, you know, going all the way back to Sacred Fool's Theater and everything else, you know, I love you, you know that, and so uh, it's always cool to talk to you. You are the best, it's so good to see you, thank you so much for joining us. Of course, all right, cool, bye. <laughs>